Well, hi everyone and happy April. Today is just the most beautiful, perfect spring day and I hope everyone's been able to get out and enjoy some of this gorgeous sunshine. It's crazy how it started out really cool, but now it's just absolute perfection. So welcome and thank you for spending your Tuesday with us. Again, you know, we could not do this without you. And I always want to thank Tom Roth with our CTSI, Courtney Hayes with our uh, Wake Forest University School of Medicine, and Audrey Bell Farrow with our Alzheimer's Disease Research Center. That's the team that helps me put this together. And of course, I'm Deb. I'm Deb Burkham. I love to be your host. And it's so fun for me when I'm out in the community doing whatever, usually with no makeup on, and someone comes up to me and says, hey, I know you from aging well. So I love it. Keep doing it. And I thank you for it. Well, we want to jump right in because our chef tonight, uh, some of you have seen before, he is not just a world-renowned research physician, he's also my sweet husband and a great home chef. And we were having this meal a couple weeks ago and we both looked at each other and said, this would be great for aging well. So without further ado, my sweet husband, Don McLean, is going to take us through making flounder piccata, and I will promise you it is absolutely delicious. Thanks, Deb. It's great to be back at um, Aging Well. Uh, tonight we're going to make uh, flounder piccata, which is uh, a dish uh, that is uh, usually a meat that's breaded and fried and served in a sauce of uh, butter, lemon, and wine with usually capers, sometimes herbs. Um, classically, it's made with veal, but certainly we don't want to kill any baby cows in the making of this meal, so we're going to make it with a thin filet fish. I got some nice flounder at uh, Sea Products over here, and uh, but sole would work. Uh, any any thin uh, little fillet of fish, you you will uh, want to have it skinned if it's not already, um, just to uh, uh, because it's going to be breaded and you're going to eat the whole thing. Um, now to serve with it, we're going to have a uh, salad and um, also some potatoes. Now uh, this is a meal that Deb and I uh, uh, cooked one night and we just thought it was so good we wanted to share it with you and uh, so uh, that's what we're uh, about to get started on. So what I've done is I've taken a shallot and chopped it finely. I've got a good healthy tablespoon of uh, capers here. Uh, I've also got uh, a little bit of wine, a half cup of wine. That's actually optional. You don't really need it. And a half cup of vegetable broth that's going to go in the sauce. Now we're going to serve it with potatoes and those are going to take the longest to cook. Uh, so I'm going to go on and get those ready uh, to go. And basically I've just got little, uh, little baby potatoes that I'm going to cut in half. If you've got larger potatoes, you can cut them into uh, fourths or uh, you know even eighths or whatever you want, however you want to do it. And we're going to oven roast them. And to do that, uh, Really, all you need is a little olive oil, salt, and pepper. They'll, they'll you know, be the best things you've ever had in your life just with that. Uh, I'm going to add a little bit more uh, than that. I'm going to uh, uh, crush a clove of garlic onto it and uh, at the end give it a little herb, uh, uh, rosemary from the garden. If you don't have a little herb garden, I highly recommend getting one. It, you know, it's so much cheaper uh, it, when you just need a sprig of rosemary not to buy, you know, spend two dollars on one of the little containers at the grocery and then watch it dry out and go bad in your refrigerator because you're not using it again. Um, and uh, they're very easy, uh, hardy, especially uh, thyme, rosemary, oregano, chives, uh, they'll even last through the winter most times. Um, you know, some of the other herbs can, can bolt on you and need a little bit more care, but those are easy ones. Okay, so I've got the um, potatoes. I've uh, added some salt and pepper. Just going to give them a splash of uh, olive oil and uh, a clove of garlic. Like I said, the garlic is optional. Uh, but uh, I like it. 
and I'm just going to toss that. And um, a trick to really get nice crispy uh, skins on the potato is actually to preheat your uh, pan that you're going to be cooking it in. I'm going to oven roast these. Um, and so I'm going to turn on the oven and put in the pan. And so by the time the oven uh, is preheated, the pan will be hot and um, uh, I can just toss the potatoes in. They're gonna, it's a very hot oven to get them crisp. Uh, so it's only going to take 20 minutes. So you have to kind of uh, plan ahead about when you're going to be eating, when the fish is going to be done, etc. Uh, and so uh, we'll start those in a sec, but I am going to start the oven preheating at 450 and throw the pan in to get it hot so we'll get those crispy skins. Okay, so while that's preheating, let's make the salad. This is a really, really nice salad. Uh, you can do all sorts of variations on it. It's uh, going to have some... Uh, blue cheese, uh, uh, dried fruit, uh, and a nice uh, dressing made of uh, orange juice uh, with uh, vinegar and oil and a little bit of mustard. So let me start. Uh, the green is going to be a combination of arugula and, and fennel. So I'm just going to throw a little handful of arugula. This uh, and then a fennel or anise. Um, these bulbs are, uh, I, I, I really love them. They're, they're underused, but they add a nice crispy, fresh flavor to the salad. Uh, a little bit like celery. What you want to do is cut off the bottom. And generally the outer, one outer leaf is going to be, uh, kind of browned. Uh, you know, you could probably use that, but, but, uh, just to make things easy tonight, I won't. And you'll see that core in there, and that's kind of tough. So when we make our slices, we'll probably punch that out. Uh, and you want some really nice thin slices here. Okay, and that's probably enough. Good handful. And you can see I'm taking out that, that tough core from the middle of each slice. It's uh, pretty obvious, you'll see, when you cut it. Uh, and I'll just kind of have the larger rings here and toss them in. And this is also going to have a little fruit in it, dried fruit. Um, easiest thing would be uh, dried cherries or uh, dried uh, cranberries if you have them. Uh, I'm going to use dates because I happen to have some dates left over in the fridge. Uh, and I'll just kind of slice those into pieces that would be about as big as a dried cherry if you're using that. And some nuts are good. Uh, I really love these. Uh, these are Trader Joe's candied pecans. Uh, and, you know, a small handful of those works well as well. Okay. Now, because it's a nice, fruity, fresh uh, dressing, we're going to make a, uh, a vinaigrette, but it's going to also have orange juice in it. So I'm going to make that about a uh, tablespoon of orange juice, juice of about a half or so, um, and a tablespoon of olive oil. And about the same amount of uh, vinegar. I'm using balsamic. You could use any kind you want. Balsamic works really well with the fruity flavors. Uh, and a little bit of mustard. Uh, you know, brown mustard. I'm using Dijon is nice. About a teaspoon or, you know, you could add more if you wanted. And because it's a uh, uh, fruity salad with dates and all in it, I'm also going to add a little cumin, but you don't have to put that in. Just salt and pepper would be fine, about a half teaspoon. Um, but the cumin picks up the orange really nicely. Uh, the fruit, uh, we're going to put a, uh, 
pair in it. So about half the pair is good. Just uh, slice it into thin slices and the other half you can have for dessert or a snack or whatever. Uh, and then crumbled blue cheese. Uh, this is actually uh, Roquefort. Uh, any kind of blue Stilton uh, would work fine in this. Um, I like Roquefort. It's really soft and salty and, and I'm just going to crumble that in there. And that's going to be our salad when I dress it. And of course you want to wait uh, to dress, not dress it until you're ready to eat so it doesn't get uh, wilty. Okay, so now we can start on the fish. And because we're about to start on the fish, I am going to grab my hot mitt <laughs> uh, and pull that pan out of the oven. Throw in the potatoes. And you want to you want to spread the potatoes out. Don't pile them up so they so they uh, will get crispy. Uh, and we'll and we'll put them back in the oven for 20 minutes. It is a hot oven, so uh, watch it closely. If your oven is not precise in temperature, it could be a little less, could be a little bit more. Okay. So to do the fish. Uh, we're first going to um, bread it, uh, coat it in uh, crumbs. You can see a nice, nice flounder fillet there. And uh, what I've done is I've seasoned the flour with salt and pepper. And I'm going to just kind of dredge the fish in the flour. That helps the next step, which is the egg. Uh, stay on the fish a little bit better. I'm going to mix that egg up. Dip the fish in the egg. Kind of messy. And then dip it in the uh, breadcrumbs. I'm using panko here, but any kind of breadcrumb would be fine. And just want to coat it all over. Be sure it's got crumbs all over it. And so you can see it's uh, nice and coated all over with the breadcrumbs. And actually, it's, a, it's good for that to dry out just a little bit because it'll help the crumbs stay with the fish uh, once you put it in the frying pan. So we're just going to let that sit there for a minute while we get ready to uh, set up the pan. And I'm going to cook it in just a little bit of oil. and a little bit of butter. Maybe a tablespoon of butter. And we're going to want that to get really hot. Uh, the butter uh, could almost be browning before you want to put it in because you really want to get the, the outside of the fish nice and browned uh, and it's a thin fish so it's going to cook quickly four or five minutes per side. See but the oil is starting to bubble the butter is starting to pop in there and, and that means it's uh, uh, getting hot enough so we're going to take our fish and put it in there. So this is on medium-high heat, and like I said, about four or five minutes for each side. Just uh, uh, leave it uh, on one side until you can kind of see underneath that the uh, breadcrumbs are nice and browned, and then flip it. And uh, then we'll just hold it on a plate 
uh, to finish. So the fish has a nice sizzle going. We're just going to uh, watch it, like I said, uh, watch it pretty closely. Okay, it's been about uh, four plus minutes, so I'm going to take a look at the uh, fish. I can see underneath it's starting to brown a little bit, but let me, yep. And as you can see, it's got a nice golden brown to it now. And so we'll just uh, let the other side cook uh, because it's real, now the fish is hot. We don't need quite as much heat. So I'm just going to turn it down just a tad. Okay, uh, fish is almost done. I'm just going to take a quick peek at the potatoes because we don't want them to burn. And I can see they're getting nice and crisp, but a uh, little, little bit of golden brown. They can use a few more minutes. And I don't know if you can see the downside of the fish is nice and brown now. And I'm just going to put that there. Okay, so now for the sauce, I'm going to add another tablespoon and a half or so of uh, butter to the pan and uh, saute just really briefly our uh, shallots. Said so this this sauce will come together really quickly so you want kind of everything else uh, ready to go because you'll want to serve the you're, you're going to want to serve this uh, fish nice and hot and then we're going to add about a half cup of broth and about the same amount of wine, same amount of wine. Like I said, the wine is optional. The alcohol will boil off in the cooking. So if you, if you don't uh, want alcohol, it, there's not going to be any left uh, by the time it cooks because we're going to cook that down by about half. Uh, let it, uh, let the liquid cook away to make a nice rich sauce. Uh, you know, you don't, uh, you can buy very small little bottles at the grocery store, so you don't even don't even need to buy an entire bottle for this. Just uh, buy one of those little bowls. Lemon, because we're going to have lemon juice in there ready to go, and a couple of lemon slices just to adorn it. And I've also picked a little rosemary from the garden that I'm going to put on the potatoes and just roughly chop it. So I'm going to look at the potatoes and they are just nice and golden brown. I don't know if you can see. So I'm going to take them off. They'll stay hot on that pan. And so you can see it's uh, boiled down by about half. It's starting to thicken up a little bit with that uh, good butter in there. Uh, so you can leave that on while you Add the capers and the juice of about half a lemon, uh, half a lemon. Uh, and so now I'm just going to slide the fish back in there into the pan and just let it reheat a little bit. That should do it. So I'm going to take the uh, fish out and plate it, put it on a plate here. Pour the sauce over it. Put the lemons on it, and there you see a beautiful, beautiful dish. Now I'll just dress the salad real quick. Throw that back up, put it on, and toss it. So put the salad on the plate. I'm going to sprinkle a little bit of that rosemary on the potatoes. And I'll put a little bit more sauce, but so I can tilt it, I just wanted to uh, show you how pretty those potatoes browned up and uh, what a delicious looking meal that is, if I do say so myself. So let's eat. And I will share with you that dinner that night was absolutely wonderful. So he is a great home chef and I'm very spoiled and I'm very grateful. Hey, we want to roll into our next segment about the Winston-Salem Symphony. Rachel Watson is the Senior Director of Education and Outreach and Inclusivity, and she is going to give us kind of the behind-the-scenes tour and an overview 
of our Winston-Salem Symphony. So Rachel, take it away. Thanks, Deb. Thank you so much for allowing us to be a part of Aging Well. I'm Rachel Watson, the Senior Director of Education, Engagement, and Inclusion at the Winston Salem Symphony. And we are here today at the UNCSA Stevens Center, just one of the places uh, that the Winston Salem Symphony performs. Come on in. And here we are in the beautiful lobby of the Stevens Center. In November of 2023, this year, this beautiful building that has been around for many, many years will be undergoing remodeling and will be closed down for at least two years. Come on, let me show you. Let's go look at the concert hall now where the symphony performs. Welcome everyone. We are now sitting here in the hall of the Stevens Center. Behind me, you see really rare footage here of the actual stage as it's not set up in concert uh, for a symphony orchestra. So we have the black wall you can see. It's not being bla uh, blocked by the concert shell. And so this is a very rare appearance for you. Um, this is, like I said, a beautiful hall and this building will be closed for renovations in November of this year. However, you still have a chance to come see our symphony orchestra perform in this space between now and May 21st of 2023. So let me tell you about all the wonderful things that we have going on. We're offering Aging Well participants a 10% discount on tickets between now and our last concert, which is May 21st. The 10% off discount code you can use by going to our website, wssymphony.org, selecting the concert that you would like to see, again, between now and May 21st, and putting in the code LIVINGWELL23. That's LIVINGWELL23. And Deb will be sending you all of this information with all of the materials to make sure you can get your tickets before the end of the season. So we have some exciting concerts for the rest of the season that I want to invite you to attend. At Reynolds Auditorium in just a couple of weeks on Saturday, April 15th, we have our Pops show. So for those of you that love Pops concerts, we hope you will join us for the REM show. That's again, April 15th, 7.30 p.m. at Reynolds Auditorium. In May, we have a full lineup of concerts. Starting on May the 6th, we have our Play Music Education Concert. This is Piedmont Learning Academy for Youth, our largest education program, where we teach students from ages first grade through high school to play string instruments and to drum. And we hope you will join us on Saturday, May 6th at 3 p.m for that Seminario concert. Additionally, on May the 7th, we have our family concert, Star Wars. This is a Star Wars show for kids. It is called The Music of Star Wars, A Young Padawan's Concert. That will be at 3 p.m. at Reynolds Auditorium on May the 7th. If you come an hour early, though, at 2 p.m., you can join us for some exciting, engaging pre-concert activities. The Instrument Petting Zoo will even be there, so families and, and, and kids can try out all the instruments that are featured in a symphony orchestra. For adults who love Star Wars, you haven't been forgotten, because on Saturday, May the 6th at 7.30, we have the Star Wars Show. The Music of Star Wars. It's an hour and a half long concert for adults. That show starts at 7.30. And for all the classical music lovers out there, join us for our final Classics 6 concert of the season. This will be on May 20th and 21st. That will be right here in the Stevens Center. And on the 20th, of May, it will be at 7.30 p.m. And on the 21st, it will be at 3 p.m. 
And this show will feature our sixth and final music director candidate, Michelle Merrill. The Winston-Salem Symphony is looking for its next music director. Who will it be? We'll find out and see. Again, if you would like to use your discount code and receive 10% off your ticket or tickets anytime between now and May 21st, which is our final concert, you can go online to wssymphony.org, purchase your tickets there, and at the checkout, you can put in your discount code LIVINGWELL23. That's LIVINGWELL23. And Deb will be sure to send you a follow-up email with all of this information, with the code, and my contact information if you'd like to reach out for more information about volunteers. We always need volunteers, always. So if you're interested in volunteering, that's another way you can get involved with the Winston-Salem Symphony. If you like what you hear today about the concert offerings for this season, we hope that you'll join the Winston-Salem Symphony next year as we move into Reynolds Auditorium for the next couple of years until the renovations here at Stevens are complete. Next season, we have a full lineup of Pops concerts and Classics concerts. I'd love to tell you about all of our Pops offerings. You will love our Carolina Christmas show, held on the weekend of Thanksgiving in November of this year. We will also have the music of Fleetwood Mac. So all of you Fleetwood Mac fans, you will absolutely love this show. If you love Ricky Skaggs, we have him coming to perform with the symphony this year as well. We also have Miss America of 2018, Miss Nia Franklin, who will be performing with the orchestra as well later in spring of 24. For all of you classical music lovers, we have the Brahms Violin Concerto. We also have a saxophone concerto a double bass concerto, and a piano concerto. So we will have a full lineup of fantastic solo artists coming to perform with our symphony orchestra next year, and we hope you can join us. If you are interested in subscribing to either a Pops concert series or a Classics concert series next year, you're welcome to do so now. You can purchase your subscriptions for next year right now. If you're interested in just purchasing tickets, just single tickets, those actually will go on sale in August of this year. The Winston-Salem Symphony is always in need of volunteers. We love our volunteers for all that they do to support the Winston-Salem Symphony. If you're interested in volunteering, please contact me as I also oversee all of our symphony volunteers. You can contact me at rwatson, W-A-T-S-O-N, at wssymphony.org. And I can send you information about how to register to volunteer. Or you can go to our website at wssymphony.org and find the volunteer page and you can register there. But for volunteer opportunities, we have so much to offer. If you're interested in working the concerts and sometimes even seeing a concert for free, you can volunteer to hand out programs or to work at our information table or even to serve as an usher and help our patrons find their seats in the hall. If you're more of an office helper or working with the music library in our office, we'd love to have you do that as well. We have lots of administrative work that can be done. So if that's your forte, we've got some things for you to do. If you are passionate about working with children, we have many different education programs where we could really use your help. We have our play music program, the Piedmont Learning Academy for Youth, that we can always use volunteers for. We have our youth orchestras program, which again, always need uh, help with concerts for those events. We have our instrument petting zoo, which we travel to different schools and churches and, and community organizations, and we allow adults and children to try out the instruments. So it's always great to have extra set of hands to help us out 
with the instruments. And no worries if you're unfamiliar with the instruments or unfamiliar with any of these opportunities. We are here to help you feel supported and to love the Winston Salem Symphony. <laughs> so as you see, the Winston Salem Symphony has something for everyone. We hope to see you at one of our concerts this season. And who knows, you could be here at our last concert on May 20th or 21st before it shuts down for renovations. So thank you again, Deb, and thank you all of you for all your support of the Winston Salem Symphony. Thank you, Rachel. It was so fun hearing, hearing everything there is to know about the symphony. So thank you. Thank you so much. Um, and now I want to not waste any time and get into the meat of tonight's presentation. Dr. Andrew Naiman is a, a physician at Atrium Health, Wake Forest Baptist in internal medicine, and specifically in the sleep clinic. And I don't think you'll find more of an expert on how to achieve sleep than Dr. Naiman. So I'm going to turn it over to you and thank you so much. I think Dr. Naiman, you are good to go. Well, thanks a whole bunch, uh, Deb. I appreciate the opportunity to serve at the Aging Wells um, uh, Symposium and being a part of the team. I really appreciate the uh, time that it takes to administer such great effort and thank you very much again. So. And you are gonna wanna put it to the format where your slide is the full screen. There we go. There you go. Thanks again. All right, well, welcome everybody. And my name is Dr. Naiman, as Deb has mentioned. I wanna to try to, in this talk, give you guys an idea of what you need to know about the importance of sleep. First of all, where are we gonna go? We're gonna talk about sleep, the factors that impact sleep, some of our own empiric uh, genetic differences that make us maybe more challenged to have a good night's sleep. Talk about really kind of 90% of problems, which are our behaviors related to sleep. And then talk about measures that can improve sleep, really improve how you feel after a night's rest. And then talk about uh, common sleep disorders that disrupt sleep. And then go over some of our own safety measures at Atrium Health Wake Forest to improve not only the quality of your life, but also uh, help mitigate against problems. Anyway, Sleep, having a sleep problem is not uncommon. Up to 70 million Americans, some estimates as much as a third of Americans, 60% of those 70 million may have an actual chronic disorder, something lasting greater than three months. Each year, sleep disorders, sleep deprivation have considerable costs, not only to our economy directly, but also indirectly. Sleep overall though, if you get a good night's rest, it's restorative. It can be associated with improved learning, improved memory, and it impacts your quality of life and aids in preventing illnesses, including cancer. But as we get older, we are challenged because our sleep isn't as good as it was when we were younger. It becomes less satisfying. We tend to take longer to fall asleep and increase more sleep disruption at night and sleep becomes less refreshing. From this diagram here on your left, you'll see that something called WAZO or wake after sleep onset increases, whereas REM sleep or deep stage sleep and slow wave sleep, also part of that deep stage sleep, actually get considerably smaller as we go from younger to older. So, you know, the plan is in place. We are not to get good sleep as we get older. That's not necessarily true, but we are more challenged. But what I do know and what we know in general is that the fewer hours of sleep you get, this can impact your quality of life, of course, but it can also impact your mortality. 
Whereas a person who gets a little bit less than five hours of sleep a night has been associated with a much increased risk of early mortality. We also know that less sleep or sleep deprivation or insufficient sleep can also cause accelerated heart age where you're actually, your heart's a lot older than the person who got seven hours sleep. And then patients that tend to have these chronic insufficient sleep, again, less than five hours as identified in the upper graph where there's an increased odds of obesity, 1.45 times higher, and also an increased odds of new onset type two diabetes and glucose resistance up to 2.5 times higher. So getting that sleep matters not only to you acutely, but also long-term. So one of the more, most common conditions, insomnia, is attributed to this insufficient sleep. And up to 40% of patients over 60 have a concern or a complaint of insomnia. Insomnia comes in three general terms, difficulty maintaining sleep, frequently awakening from their sleep, or difficulty falling asleep. Things that contribute to insomnia include our environment. Are there a lot of disruptors in bed? Is the environment too hot when I sleep? Some of it is genetics. My whole family is a night owl. Or in some cases, it's induced like in elite athletes who do excessive training or significant training, particularly at late at night. And then some of it transitory, like pregnancy, a beautiful time of life, but oftentimes associated with disruptive sleep. And yes, as women, uh, life span changes, so too does their disruption in sleep as they become postmenopausal. But certain behaviors definitely impact our sleep, and we are constantly inviting patients and encouraging them to act, have different behaviors. For instance, light emitting devices, one to two hours um, prior to bedtime has been associated with significant sleep disruption up to two hours after going to bed. <coughs> Caffeine use has also been attributed to difficulty falling asleep, particularly four to six hours prior to bedtime. And then finally, abnormal sleep cycles. For instance, a person that goes from East Coast to West Coast very commonly can also disrupt and impact not only their acute sleep needs, but long-term. And then of course, alcohol and sedatives, although great in initiating sleep, has also been attributed to increased distractions during sleep. These factors affect two essential drives in our sleep, something called pro, uh, um, process S or sleep loading, that as the sleep, as the time of the day increases, our sleep load escalates to that peak where we try to fall asleep. And then process C, our own natural circadian rhythm, where you would like to see these two processes align so that you can have good quality sleep. What we know is that when we talk about circadian rhythms and circadian disorders, we're talking about a particular part of the brain called the suprachiasmic nucleus. And this nucleus is triggered by a number of factors, light being one of the strongest. Exercise, meaning early morning exercise, induces sleep at night, whereas late exercises causes early awakening. Melatonin, a natural substance that your body produces, is also a significant trigger to help you maintain your circadian rhythm. But as we get older, as in other slides will demonstrate, melatonin kind of drops off a little bit, making it more challenging. And then, of course, among females that in which estrogen and progesterone um, levels change over time, so do does the quality of sleep. So what we know, though, also is that the circadian rhythms have their own 24-hour cycle, and that when we displace that cycle, maybe six hours later when you travel from East Coast to West Coast, the change of that circadian shifts, but if you're there too long, it not, may ne necessarily shift back when you come back to the East Coast. So understanding shifting factors is key. 
So when we talk about aging and circadian rhythms, again, I talk about how the suprachiasmic nucleus at, may develop deterioration and with that reduction in melatonin production. And then we become more sensitive or less sensitive to that bright light exposure, particularly as we age and become more recluse or more homebound. Genetic predispositions to irregular sleep include two major sleep phase syndromes, advance and delay. Advance is what we commonly known as mor morning larks, where you tend to go to bed earlier in the evening and wake up real early in the morning, sometimes at, you know, at two or three in the morning. Whereas delayed sleep phase syndrome, those folks tend to be night owls, right? A late night to bed and doesn't wake up until the afternoon in some cases when you ask a teenager. So as we look at these two different problems or phase syndromes, people get misaligned with their, their community. They tend to may have some challenges with depression or difficulty uh, getting, holding a job. So we like to help people understand that this is a genetic problem, that there are ways of dealing with it successfully particularly <clears throat> when we apply bright light. So if we take that early morning lark, the one with advanced sleep phase syndrome and give them bright light right at when the time that they wanna fall asleep, maybe shifting this to the right, that person may actually sleep at a more appropriate time that fits within their social structure and feel more and stay in bed until, you know, the sun shines into their room. But if you take that same bit of light and you apply it when they wake up inappropriately at three in the morning, well, that will cause them to wake up earlier, making this problem even worse. So we try to take these understandings of when to apply bright light to make it a better scenario for the patient. Another thing is shift worker syndrome, very common among patients with sleep disorders that have sh uh, that sh constantly shift. And with that, they have lapses in their vigilance and attention. They have decrease in their work performance and they have reduced cognitive throughput, which means executive functioning, not completing a task accurately. So with that, we try to tell folks that shift worker syndrome, you need to have a good plan in place because more disruption in your sleep can even create other um, endogenous problems like for females, problems with fertility or menstrual irregularities, even longer time to be become pregnant. And in fact, more disruption in the sleep cycle can also create oncogenic expression or creating problems of cancer. So again, behavioral improvements, what are some of those simple rules? Avoid caffeine and nicotine at least six hours prior to sleep strict adherence to a sleep and wake time, avoid late night meals and snacks, and early evening or morning exercise routines are best. There is an app called Somrisk, which your provider can help you to help get you in train with proper sleep behavior. Other things are long naps are not a good idea. Try to take a 45 minute nap. And if you're a shift worker, prior to your shift will actually improve your vigilance. Light emitting devices prior to bedtime, a bad thing. But bright light when awakening is very good because it will help you standardize your sleep. Hot showers prior to bedtime, not so good because that circadian rhythm is very um, sensitive to temperature changes. So we like cooling showers after late extreme exercise, which pumps you up, gets you all hot and bothered, can't fall asleep. So as we talk about behavior, some patients have come to me and say, hey, doc, how do I measure my sleep quality? I got this cool uh, device from Amazon. Well, this whole thing is an explosion of consumer sleep technology. It really happened during COVID. However, a lot of different toys means a lack of standardization. And so there, therefore, there is a commitment of the American Academy of Sleep Medicine to help push these companies to have transparency of how they collect the information, make it truly consumer available and accurate. 
and because of the lack of normative data and absence of guidelines. So with that, <coughs> a common device that's now available, in fact, used by some, um, uh, some exercise uh, intensive, including the NCAA, is the WHOOP device, which can track a person's sleep quality and sleep time. But its overall accuracy is okay, and it's not yet FDA approved. Whereas the uh, single signal mandibular movement, i.e. detecting snoring in short term, has been FDA cleared and is available. And actually, it's rather predictive of someone with a possible sleep disorder breathing. That being said, you take a whole bunch of these different devices, and they all have some variability in identifying your sleep cycle. So I tell everybody. If you have a sleep problem, see a doctor, have share this information with them. It may or may not be entirely beneficial, but if it helps you track and get into better sleep, then it may be worthwhile using. Then we're going to talk about other common sleep disorders, restless legs, for instance, and obstructive sleep apnea. What is restless legs? Well, it's this creepy crawling sensation that occurs in your legs. It begins worse or begins or gets worse at rest or sleeping, and is relieved with activity. And in fact, it is actually um, worse in the evening or night than it is during the day. If you answered three of four of these questions, you have a high probability, greater than 80%, of having restless legs. So having restless legs doesn't mean it just came from mom or dad, but it can be associated with other disease states such as anemia or kidney disease or neurologic injury or pregnancy, in fact. And it can, its frequency actually increases with age. So if you have those symptoms, seek medical attention. Have them discuss it because it could be the window to a different problem. Then I want to get to the probably the most common disorder that we see in the sleep lab, which is sleep apnea syndrome or sleep disorder breathing. Sleep apnea is this period of where you're making an effort to breathe, but no airflow. It must last at least 10 seconds and associate it with an oxygen drop. Now, obstructive apnea is when you're making effort, but no flow. Central apnea is a different disease where no effort, no flow. It may be indicative of a neurologic or heart problem. Mixed apnea is the combination of the obstructive and central. And then another common term is hypopnea, where there's a significant reduction in flow lasting for at least 10 seconds with an associated drop in oxygen. What we know is that this is an undiagnosed disease state with a significant burden in which up to 82% of men and 93% of women have not been diagnosed with active symptoms. We also know that this disease is associated with multiple other comorbidities or disease states like diabetes, heart failure, a hemispheric stroke, or even folks that require chronic pain therapy for chronic pain, or, or in fact, those patients who suffer with other neurologic disorders like Alzheimer's. What we also know is that there's considerable, that this disorder has been associated with certain risk factors. Obesity being one, in which a body mass index just over 29 can put people at increased risk. Neck circumference for males greater than 17 and a half inches or 18 inches, females greater than 16 inches have also been attributed to increased risk. It is a male predominant disease and age is also a problem, particularly when we get above the age of 50. So postmenopausal women and other endocrine disorders like thyroid disorders also have a higher risk of having this problem. And then what we've identified at Wake Forest, that even among high-risk pregnancy, a significant increased prevalence of sleep apnea syndrome when compared to non-high-risk pregnancy. So the faces of sleep apnea aren't always people who are overweight or obese, but can occur among thin patients, like in this case where a patient's jaw is recessed, or in this case where the patient has a large tongue, so large it's pushing against his teeth, or in this case, 
as in, as in cases of most children, children with very large tonsils that snore may in fact have sleep apnea syndrome. What we know about sleep apnea is that that constant stopping of airflow and that drop in oxygen level is attributed to something called sympathetic activity, which increases. So here in this depiction to your far left, you will see kind of a blunt activity when a person is actively breathing. As the apnea persists, the sympathetic activity escalates. And with that, escalating blood pressures. So you take this person who had a blood pressure of 140 over 90, now up to 250 over 120 during sleep. And it again normalizes during the day. So that activation, that disruption affects many processes in our brain and in our heart. But it can also affect our vigilance and our reaction times when driving. In this depiction, you see people in a simulated um, you know, screen in which a, a person who's above the legal limit under the influence of alcohol actually performed better than a sleepy person with sleep apnea. So as I mentioned before, certain disease states, <coughs> including uh, uh, with associated with severe sleep apnea, has been associated with mortality high blood pressure, cardiovascular, cerebrovascular, pulmonary disorders like pulmonary hypertension, metabolic and kidney disease, and in fact, sudden death at night. But we also know from this study that was performed here that those patients with sleep apnea on CPAP had the same risk as a normal person versus the person who had high uh, severe sleep apnea had a much higher risk of both fatal and non-fatal cardiovascular events. Other things that sleep apnea has been attributed to has been complications that we see in the hospital sometimes, where a patient may actually have a code blue or what's called code stroke event, where they look like they're having problems breathing or events that mimic or look like or may be a stroke. They also tend to have higher ICU days and hospital days, and yes, an increased mortality. So can we mitigate or improve a person's circumstance in the hospital and with certain techniques as well as identification? So it's important for us as providers, as you as patients and talking to other folks to be able to identify a patient with sleep apnea. So you take kind of the sequence of symptoms plus physical exam findings, and doctors use some validated questionnaires. And at Wake Forest, we have something called the Do I Snore 50 questionnaire, which is a validated questionnaire that helps us not only identify sleep apnea, but also patients at risk for those medical emergency team activation or code blue and code stroke. Because of this screening process and using this screen, and collaborating with surgeons, anesthesiologists, sleep specialists, neurologists, pulmonologists, we were able to provide some benefit to our patients. It requires a very intensive tool of mandating screens and using insignia on the patient's wrist, having providing them sleep apnea consultation and opioid sparing protocols. And with all that in place, we were able to provide a closed loop um, a treatment plan for these patients get them identified and get them treated. And with that, fewer events occur. And that is, so that is to the success story of this team approach, but it shows you how important that if you get admitted to the hospital and you have these symptoms, please share it with your provider. So once we identify a person who's maybe at risk, what's the next step? Well, we need to do a sleep study. And a sleep study conducts of six essential tests, EEG leads placed on your scalp, echocardiogram where you have leads on your chest, an electromyelogram leads on your legs, an electrooculogram, you know, where leads are placed above and below your eyes, as well as pulse oximetry, looking like um, somebody that's all wired for sound, as I have heard from my patients. But this is the gold standard test. And it's important, particularly among patients, who have heart disease or rhythm problems or things like COPD or stroke, this would be the preferred test. 
because we don't want to miss the disease. Otherwise, we can use a home study, now universally available, helping us to improve access to patient care. These devices look as simple as something that fits on your wrist, a probe on your finger, and a little thing on your chest. So it's not as intrusive as an in-lab study, but it's not meant for everybody, but helps us help you. So once we have identified a person with sleep disorder breathing, then CPAP therapy is the standard of care. And as a result of it, and after 40 years of excellent evidence and studies, what we know is that CPAP improves symptoms, decreases medical emergency team activation, decreases in blood pressure, stroke, and MI. It may actually reduce recurrent atrial fib rates and improve a person's heart failure management. And in fact, has been demonstrated to improve ejection fraction, a number we do to identify a person's heart pump function and it also improves neurologic status. When used in the hospital, it improves people that have those oxygen drops in the hospital or post-operative pneumonia and decreases their ICU and hospital days. But CPAP is not meant for everybody. And in fact, in recent guideline statements, if you can't tolerate CPAP, other approaches are needed. And so surgical approaches are commonly used, particularly in tonsillar enlargement in kids, not necessarily adults. But in adults, a secondary method, something called nerve stimulator implants, new to the system for the past 10 years, but really has broke open over the last couple. And what it is, what it essentially does, it helps move by stimulating the nerve, and in this case, the only FDA approved product, the Inspire device, the hypoglossal nerve, it stimulates the tongue to move forward and the back of the throat to open up. However, although this is the only FDA approved, there are others coming along the way. So how do you, are you eligible for something like this? Well, if you're an adult over the age of 18 and most insurers will take 22, diagnosed with moderate to severe sleep apnea, no less than 15 events an hour, <coughs> must have tried at least CPAP before, or absolutely because of profound um, PTS or PTSD or problems with claustrophobia, can't tolerate CPAP and can't have other disorders like central or mixed sleep apnea. When a person goes for this surgery, it looks like two small incisions, one just below the chin and at the chest as depicted. What we do know is that when up to 80% of patients have, um, or up to 80% of patients have 50% improvement in their sleep apnea number. And at Wake Forest, we're our patient excellence program here. And due to our performance, both in improving the person's sleep apnea, as well as improving their wakefulness as demonstrated by the Epworth sleepiness score. But it takes time. So, Patient excellence means we all got to be invested. This can take up to 90 days before a person finally feels the treatment has been superior. But in some cases, it could take even longer, up to six months. So be prepared. If this is something you're interested in, just be patient. And once Inspire has provided significant improvement, but not complete resolution, sometimes we employ neck flexion with the Inspire device nasal or oral breathing or jaw thrusting. And sometimes in significant cases, we add CPAP therapy. But treatment doesn't end there. If you have mild to moderate OSA, even an adjustable oral appliance has been very helpful. This is now being challenged a little bit by some of the patients developing jaw um, tenderness or discomfort or something called um, uh, uh, arthritis in the joint. Other devices have now come along where this device actually fits in your mouth as depicted here, stimulating the back of your tongue, help entrain the tongue, and actually can reduce the, the severity of your sleep apnea if you only have mild OSA. So key points, OSA is common, prevalent among patients with comorbidities, common among perioperative patients, and a majority are undiagnosed. 
So screening is essential and please don't shy away from it. Overall, please recognize that reduced sleep worsens outcomes. Improve your heart age, get that uh, extra sleep. As we change, recognize it gets compromised. Avoid habits that disrupt sleep. And recognize, do you have a symptom of a sleep disorder, whether restless legs or sleep apnea? Know that sleep apnea is a significant health risk, and you please be screened if you have symptoms. And recognize that treatment is available to lower our risk and morbidity. And with that, I want to say thanks again to Aging Well, and thank you, Deb, for your, the time allowed. Well, I thank you, Dr. Naiman, and we want to encourage people, if you have questions, please put them in the chat. We already have one that, um, and this was a question I had actually thought of earlier as well. Mm -hmm. it, do you have to have a referral from your uh, daily, your PCP provider to come to your sleep lab? Uh, in most cases, that's probably ideal. You know, a majority of sleep disorders are actually managed by primary care. So, however, direct referrals are received at Wake Forest. And so if you wish to go that route, um, please be inclined to do so. You know, I could tell you it's 716-5555. Uh, <laughs> there we go. That's easy enough to remember. So the um, Inspire machine, I, I have seen that um, advertised on TV as, as, a, as a, what, counter to the CPAP machine, but it made it sound like tonight that that would be a, a process to get to that, correct? Right, so, so exactly, Deb, thank you for asking. You know, most insurers put some restrictions and, and for good reason, our outcome studies for CPAP are well known and well proven. And so most insurers like most sleep specialists, including myself, want you to try the gold standard that we know has improved outcomes affiliated. And Inspire is new and is actually making it, you know, I consider it a game changer in many, in many circumstances, offering something where patients that just could not tolerate CPAP for whatever reason, are now you know, able to use something to sleep better and control their sleep apnea. So yes, you need to try CPAP at least once. And if you have terrible PTSD or claustrophobia, you know, have that discussion with your sleep doctor that you could never even think about using a CPAP. But those are the cases that we really have to go to, go to bat for the patient in order for insurance to you know, agree to it. So there is a process and uh, for good, you know, like I said, for good reasons, you know, it's, it is a surgery. So you're going to undergo the knife and get a little cut here, a little wire that goes down your neck into your chest where they put a little pacemaker pocket right here. Mm -hmm. And all those things are things that patients don't realize. And like I said, 80% of patients get better with 50% reduction, but mm -hmm. there are some patients, about one in five, that don't have resolution of their snoring. And then uh, some patients have still some mild residual sleep apnea. But in the patients that we care for, we have had some really good success in people that just could not tolerate CPAP before. So I really, if that if that is you, please consider it. Okay, we have some more questions. So what is your idea about using melatonin before evaluating for a sleep problem? Well, it depends upon what the sleep problem is. And I think overall melatonin is a pretty safe drug, especially used at a five milligram dose or less. Sometimes 10 milligrams can be used, but I would talk to your doctor before you go there. But the the premise for saying that is, let's say, for instance, yours is a sleep disorder breathing problem. Melatonin is not beneficial in those circumstances. But if you have problems with initiating or maintaining sleep and you haven't seen your doctor yet, and you want to give melatonin a, a try, I think it's very noteworthy. I tell people, first fix your behavior. Really look at other things that distracting your bedtime, you know, sleeping with pets, 
you know, drinking caffeine 12 o'clock at night, you know, or playing games, gaming at night and thinking you're going to fall right to sleep. You know, those are common things we get asked about. And we try to encourage people to really kind of avoid those things as much as possible. And then after you've done all that, then I would say you give, a, give melatonin a fair chance. And that's when it would work. And I like the medication that's rapid dissolving because most people like to take it just before bedtime. If you take the tablet of melatonin, some of the preparations are intended to be ingested in your stomach, which takes four hours before it makes it for a significant improvement. And so that's why the rapid onset or dissolving tabs tend to have a little bit better consistent response. And so with the rapid dissolving, how close to bedtime should you take that one? Oh, good question. 30 minutes to an hour. Okay, great. Well, we've got more questions coming at you. So uh -oh. which, is, which is worse, poor sleep or good sleep with the help of a mild sedative? Ooh, that's a good question. Well, so of course, good sleep with a mild sedative under the guidance of your provider. So I always say that to folks, especially in some of my own patients that have suffer with chronic insomnia that have had very safe use of a sedative with yearly or bi-yearly evaluations, making sure they don't develop sedative related problems, including escalating doses that lead to sleepwalking, sleep talking, nocturnal eating, or even in fact, in dream enactment where a person you know, acts out their dreams. Some of these drugs have been attributed to it. And that's why yearly or bi-year or biannual evaluations are needed. Okay. For postmenopausal women, is there a safe hormone that would help us sleep better? That is like the, um, that's a great question. I always get asked that question when I showed that slide because I think it's so important. And so some, I, I always tell folks, every patient is different. And so is every patient depending on their home hormone expression. And I tell folks to really talk to their OBGYN or their primary care provider and try to have a good understanding which would be a safe product. But one product does not fit all. And our last question uh, so far is how serious is snoring? And I well, think that depends if you're the wife too. <laughs> yeah, well, I think like with all of this, snoring is a very common problem and not every patient with snoring has sleep apnea. And not every sleep apnea patient snores. So that's another slide I left out of the deck this time around. But the, the point of being is if it is associated with a person who feels tired during the day, has really some daytime symptoms, um, can't you know maintain sleep, or has been associated with problems with headaches, you know, those are folks that probably need to be evaluated for more than just snoring. Snoring alone can cause those problems. So some folks that don't have sleep apnea, but have significant snoring that creates a lot of problems, may need to be evaluated also by a provider, either to adjust the jaw forward or trim down the tonsils or, you know, or tongue. You know, those things do exist and can create problems for patients. Well, Dr. Naiman, oh wait, we have one more. Okay. What is the best way to clean the CPAP hose? So um, a lot of the industry provides very clear details about using soap and water or vinegar. And then patients have gotten into the SoClean device. And what has happened is there's been considerable reporting regarding recalls of certain CPAP devices. And some of that recall has been attributed to the use of SoClean with certain devices. Now, more is to be said about that. I will say, if you are interested in reading more about it, you can go to what's called the Respironics Recall um, and you can log in, read about it, I would say, and go to the American Academy Sleep Medicine website. So I opened up Pandora's box with that, but 
will say the following. Please follow the recommended cleaning protocol offered by the medical equipment company who gave you your device. Because in some cases, they will not cover the device if it gets comp compromised if you use one of those other external cleaning systems. Great. Well, Dr. Neiman, thank you so much. This is such an important issue and and um, I'm just always thrilled when you can join us and share with us what you know, because you know we're all about aging well. So until May 9th, I want a date with everyone on this call. Please make a date to join us in May. And until then, enjoy this spring weather, be safe, have fun, and we'll talk soon.